welfare and productivity enhancing activities uh, for the lower tier. So if we look at the constraints and issues that these small scale traders face, uh, we can design a portfolio of projects that um, really improve the legal, financial and social means available for them and allow them to become more productive and manage risk better. And these include uh, improving their access to finance, improving their access to information, education and skills, um, and um, just providing a general basic level of social protection. And in respect to the female traders, uh, it includes improving the treatment that they currently experience on the borders. Um, on the, uh, as a second um, strategy, it's about improving uh, the incentives for formalization in the upper tier. And this is mostly about creating a business and trading environment that encourage, encourages formalization. And it's about lowering transaction costs um, of cross-border trade, but also increasing the benefits of formalization. However, I think it has to be recognized that the very strong vested interests that currently um, are invested in, in the informal system means that this doesn't require just a technocratic solution, but actually a political engagement at all levels of governance, from customs to local uh, officials to even national, um, the national level. Um, and finally, it has to be recognized that while informal cross-border trade is an important way uh, of improving the livelihoods of local populations, in the long term, um, it would actually be much more beneficial to create economic growth that um, stimulates the growth of formal enterprises and formal jobs um, rather than focusing exclusively on informal, on informal employment. Um, so thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to your questions. This symposium is proposed, I mean, this is the first time I think that's what I was, I, was, I mean, I heard from the morning that we need to have very specific uh, recommendations uh, that could be given to trademark East Africa to take up an implementable programs or projects. Also, influence them at policy level to draw, to draw a policy. From there, maybe you can try to develop some implementable or operational programs. First, I must thank Elias. I think he is mailing me for the last four or five months. Elias, I think, I, you know, he is, yeah, he's over there. Okay. Uh, because, you know, I thought when I was writing to him, you know, he is sending so many papers. I said, yes. <laughs> I would be an hard man out uh, here. Because since he said trade, because I've been working for the last 24 years with the Ministry of Commerce in India. And as well as with the internet, I mean, there is an institute called Indian Institute of Foreign Trade, and then we work with WTO issues and all. So then I agreed because of the trade. And it's, my journey is also quite, you know, it's very cumbersome, you know, almost it took me two days at the age of 50, right? Anyway. But let me go with very specific remarks of this research, one by one, um, what I understood from, you know, from the Lucia. As I said, I'm just looking at the clock, you know. I'll finish exactly 10 minutes, maybe plus three minutes because of my slow speaking, okay. The first point is that, as I said, it's a very specific, uh, you know, the recommendations. I'm sorry to say to Lucia, because this is a whole, uh, the paper which I read through, it is totally a review paper I understood, I presume, I guess. And certain recommendations, what she has recommended, for example, the first one, you know, the improving the productivity at lower level of trade, that is the, she called low tire. There again, I, I could not find anything very specific, you know, recommendation or strategies which we can team up, team on, team Yava, trademark East Africa can take up, that is one part of it. But surprisingly, after this paper, I was, from the yesterday onwards, I'm just looking through here, some of the data, which I'm going through it. There is a website I just gone through, it is an East African community portal. I think probably many of you, I think you are all browsing those data. And even after that, you know, they, they did, what is that, the marketplace, I went there and then I spoke to uh, about 10 to 15 minutes with the one Mr. Yeah, there are two guys over there, that's called Tanzania Chamber of Commerce and Industry and Agriculture. So after this, you know, I have so many things in my mind. It's the earlier just I, Paper I read it, I gave a lot of comments that this paper is like this. 
But after came, I mean, after I come here, after going through the data set, something is pricking my mind is that this informal trade really, really very, very crucial how to formalize by making a policy, then com coming into the implemental programs, and that the TMR role is something is very crucial. I remember when I worked with this WTO for certain policy negotiation at the different ministry level conferences, the one thing it came up is a special product case, so which I am the part of it uh, from Indian side. What are the different types of special products can be, you know, negotiated at the WTO forum? And similarly, the aid for trade. But this paper says that the aid for trade, because the basically I think probably you can go to the website today, WTO website even today, there is an announcement that the aid for trade conference is going to be held in 2015 around in February, what the, exactly the aim for. The mostly I could say the aid for trade is supply related factors or supply related infrastructure facilities. The morning the whole presentation I could see there are some infrastructure may have been developed by the trademark East Africa to make, to, all, to simplify the, you know, the procedures of the transport and as well as you know, the, you know, the transaction cost. I think the slide which I saw in the morning is that you know the Singapore? Yes, I remember the Singapore is the one country in the world when we compare the the transaction cost. We estimated the transaction cost because we try to put it to the, our government side. What the Indian government is doing on this transaction cost? How much when it relate to the other countries? The one country which is the the quickest quickest way of you know exporting is is this, I mean what you call Singapore. But here, I think the, the, the East African countries also, I looked at it because, you know, the morning presentation and all. And probably where it is very crucial, and this paper should come out very specifically because since the informal trade is almost 50% of GDP, and I've looked at the whole data in the East Africa, and when GDP if work out the 50%, really, you know, something, you know, if it is get formalized, and the amount of trans, amount of, you know, the money which comes back to the government to reinvest, it's something is huge. What I'm saying, you right? So when you say the 50% of GDP is something informal trade, and one policy suggestion which you are making is to formalize that, though not in the lower, I mean the low tire system, low tire, you know, the trade, but the middle one, which is Mr. Contraband, you said. Yes, really, if you do that, if you get that thing is get formalized, maybe the Tima could work with the ministry, I mean, with the, all these EAC region governments, how to formalize those informal trade particularly, you know, this one, that is the contraband brand. If that you could be able to do the number which I worked out from the, this, you know, the portal and the 50% something, it's quite amazing, and that could be used for the reinvestment. That is the very, very important. That's one part of it. Number two, <laughs> number two, I, 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 I mean, the, 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 you said the structure and segmentation of the informal trade. But I feel this paper, it, you know, there are further research is necessary because I, I understand that you know, she comes out, the paper writers have comes out the problem of data. And moreover, as a research paper, I said, I mean, I'm sorry to tell you here, because there is a research paper, I don't know, because you are going to bring out this, you know, you have to be very, very careful in, you know, methodological issues, right? So what is it? You said the qualitative data, quantitative data, and it is very difficult. No, sometimes I'm, I'm sorry to tell you here. I'm extremely sorry because I didn't get anything out of it. You know, what is that methodology of used? You said which methodology of used and how you have collected the data. Is it only the review paper you picked up? Okay, at least even if the review paper, it would be possible for you to pick up those numbers and estimates and come out this. You know, when you showed this graph, but that graph I didn't see in, the, in my paper, which you sent to me earlier. The graph, the Uganda graph, you know, the formal trade is a fluctuating, you know, it's too much. And that is where, as a researcher, it is important why is fluctuating, what are the reasons to fluctuate. Suppose there is a trough. You try to pick up from the trough what are the reasons and try to make it a specific recommendation out of it. That trough is due to, it is due to supply side factors or it is demand side factor or the policy side factors. And you try to pick it up, which is the most crucial, and try to make it more specific recommendation for them. that would be very, they would be very fine for them, you know, because they want very specific. Number that, that's one part of it. Number two, I want uh, you know more specific recommendation is come, can be you know can be had from this is that when I 
spoke to this Tanzania, Tanzania group, so they developed uh, an extraordinary you know, software for, for the traceability issues. I found the same things in, happen in India to that, that for that matter, particularly because I'm an agriculture university professor, so I know what kind of difficulties these farmers are facing in case of traceability issues. And I have seen few people who have developed the traceability, the certificate, and then the whole software. This Tanzania group has developed such, you know, the, the origin of, you know, they have, I think, accredited for giving the, you know, the, you know, what you call the certificate of origin. And they just, she has shown me, I was, you know, very curious about to know about how it works, the whole software and all. And then I think I should, you know, you know, apply them because, you know, the extraordinary software. And this is where probably maybe this is a model or uh, this could be replicated in the other cases also to make it, you know, what do you call, you know, reduce the transaction curve for which your paper could have come out with se several, sec I mean, recommend specific recommendation taking, you know, case studies also. You got my point, what I'm saying. Similar case studies can also be flashed. Okay, this is our, no, this is the Tanzanian case, this is most successful. Would it be possible in Ethiopia, I mean, in Kenya, it could be recommended so that what kind of investment comes from, what is the policy side, how it get accredited, who is accredited, I mean, giving accreditation to those agencies, suppose that new private company or the organization comes in. That is an another part of it. It's very important because the third, I mean, another one I'm really I'm, I'm wondering is that You said the the paper says that I mean not from the mostly from empirical but mostly from the review there is a lot of bureaucratic export and import procedures that hampers the formal trade means that either that promotes the informal trade either rather rather than hampers I would say it's a promoting the the informal trade but in the morning presentation I could able to see that you know because of the chima right. There are some changes that have taken place. Okay, something has something have I mean something has taken place. And you said there is a custom in this EAC custom union that was started in 2005. Okay, so I would suggest here that if the study would come out with some kind of temporal analysis, really, you got my point. What I'm saying, you some temporal analysis based on the temporal analysis, we could be able to come out. Yes, these are the areas where we need a, some kind of, or these are the areas where there is a procedural, I mean, procedural lapses. Where are the areas where there are some weaknesses so that it could help the trademark East Africa to come out with certain very strong implication. Okay, so these are the areas where we, whether it is infrastructure related or is it supply side related infra, I mean, uh, constraints where you have to focus or demand side or the policy side. So that will be useful for them to, to draw some kind of, you know, the strategies and all. And finally, I, I take one minute. So can I have a water, please? Given this paper is a review paper, and I just made a small table, I think I, I've sent you, right? And you have come out with the reason for every positive argument, for every negative argument for the, for the, for the, the informal trade. You pick up one or two reasons uh, from those review papers, and if you work out some empirical estimation, if you come out with those reasons, you know, they've said, you know, on. You pick up one reason and try to, you know, analyze that reason, come out with an empirical prescription uh, that would really the help team. Okay, but as a publication, I think you know, as a review paper, I'm a publish. I mean, I'm in a what you call suppose as long as I'm a reviewer for publication, I would say this is a review paper. I need a lot of comments to get it published. But if you want a, a, rec a specific recommendation paper, I, I I need the whole of 
the you know, research is further is required on this paper. Means that we have to come out, I mean, you have to do a lot of exercises on this. And then finally, when you come out with certain conclusions and all, if it is a, if it is a publication, the story is different. And if it is come to be a very specific recommendation for the, the means the policy paper or whatever the paper for team have, the trademark East Africa, then, then it needs a lot and lot and rigorous exercises. So thank you very much. But what would, would they do? A lady takes about three to five children. They go across, they come with 10 kilos each or five kilos, and they had the house where they were collecting. By the end of the day, they had like about 200, 250 kilos, which they are going to sell without paying tax. So it is all intertwined in the two. On one hand, the, the, the traders will lose, but also on the other hand, the government also lose revenue. So it's something which we need to look into as we deal with both, both sides. I just wanted to comment on that. Thank you. My first comment was just, um, I was slightly, um, your comment about uh, the disempowerment of uh, female cross-border traders in the lower tiers uh, got me thinking a little bit because my perceptions were slightly actually that these women are actually, um, compared to uh, the local population, I'd argue that educational attainment, completion of primary or secondary level, is actually a bit higher, quite, quite a lot higher than the average in the countries that we're talking about. Um, these women are networked. Um, you know, both in their country and across the border, networked in their communities to source the items that are trading. So I'm not 100% comfortable with the comment of these women as, as disempowered. I would actually argue that they are, um, I mean, not, there's not complete gender parity, as you noted, with the um, value of the items being traded. But I would argue these women are actually quite powerful in their, in their areas. Um, and my second comment is actually to echo uh, my colleague over here. I did not catch who you were, I'm sorry. But um, that I think, again, just to say that I don't think, uh, if we spoke to these women, I don't think they'd necessarily identify what they're doing as informal trade. I think they would argue that they're complying with the regulations that are presented to them at the border, which, as my colleague identified, are often more costly than the regulations that are imposed by the EAC. Um, so I suppose trying to think of practical recommendations, that leads us to think of uh, supporting the... Uh, uh, informal cross-border trader groups that exist, trying to expand their activity and presence at the border and increase uh, levels of sensitization uh, in all languages required um, to cre create awareness about the, uh, the real custom regulations. My question is, did you come across any examples at all of success in dismantling some of this, like what I would call border mafia? And um, the other question sort of is, is kind of putting my URA Commissioner Customs, kind of, sort of, <laughs> uh, to, to ask if uh, perhaps there's an example from uh, what experience they've had in Uganda uh, dealing with this same issue, to try and get it down to uh, practical terms. For the presentation, I think all of us were not able to go as in depth as we would like in terms of addressing the topic at hand. Um, so all of your comments are really welcome and I think if we were to ever expand on these papers it would be great to incorporate more data, more of the kind of really, really first-hand information that you know you talked about. Um, in terms of the effects of structural adjustment programs um, on informalization, um, to be honest I don't know enough about kind of um, the macroeconomic uh, uh, macroeconomies of East Africa at the moment to tell you but I know that um, the fall, like falling wages and lack of um, informal jobs has continued. And so these have continued to push um, households to, uh, to informality and to supplement their incomes uh, through informal cross-border trade and other informal activities. Um, and um, in terms of the comment on disempowerment, um, I guess I think I meant it in a slightly different sense. Um, what I meant is more that uh, in the current form that this trade um, happens, there is very uh, little room uh, for kind of long-term poverty reduction and really lifting these um, households out of poverty. And I think that actually creates a special imperative for donors to engage more with ICBT um, and provide the legal, financial, and social means to help these households lift themselves out of poverty through the activities they're already uh, performing. Um, and I agree with you about um, kind of um, these um, 
traders being informal only in the kind of very strict sense of that word. Uh, they're not registered and they not, don't pay income tax, but when they pass through the borders, they do pay substantial money, often much more than they should be paying, as the um, other lady commented. Um, and, um, oh yeah, in terms of the kind of uh, practical uh, ideas you mentioned, I know the World Bank, for example, is already uh, working on these issues in Rwanda, um, and they have um, set up cross-border trade charter uh, at a few of the border posts. Um, and they have posted this and they're monitoring whether this is kind of affecting how the f uh, female traders are being treated. And similarly, they're uh, working directly with the women's associations um, on kind of uh, promoting information and access to finance um, so that they can um, really expand their businesses, their informal businesses. Um, unfortunately, in terms of dealing with the mafia, I think there's, in fact, so little research on this. It's only a few researchers have really done research on this, and it's kind of, you know, from a very academic perspective, not in terms of um, how you can actually address it from a poli policymaker point of view. So, unfortunately, I can't really give you um, any practical examples, but perhaps your colleague um, at the Uganda Revenue Authority has some uh, has some ideas. Critical hat and put a a visual hat and use this brilliant picture that um, is, is, is before us. The first uh, observation and recommendation is that we see a truck. That truck, if I'm not wrong, is being loaded with bananas. They're not coming off the truck. So the concept there is collectivization. How could we help to collectivize produce in forms of uh, um, um, cooperatives or societies or whatever uh, other um, um, form they may be. It helps, number one, in getting better prices, assuming there are no monopolistic tendencies. Um, one truck means a monopoly. I would be more happy if there were five trucks. That means um, you could trade to different um, sellers. Um, it also means that the revenue authorities, and my namesake Richard is here, you, you're able to tax the man on the truck when he passes through uh, a suitable point, okay? Otherwise, you will not be able to reach uh, these, uh, uh, the rest of the people here. Um, the second thing is value addition and value chain analysis. Um, I can see, if I'm not wrong, potatoes and bananas. How do we um, address the value chain in potatoes and bananas to make sure that these people get better, better prices for their, uh, um, for their produce? Um, the third aspect um, is growth poles. Along the transport corridors, how do we set up industries that are capturing and adding values, uh, adding value, and then creating growth poles to attract um, um, a more formalization and job creation? And of course, for the M&E people in the room, I see more women in that picture than men. Therefore, you've got better gender reach. So how can we then help collectivization, stroke society, stroke cooperatives, to agglomerate produce, from gender, uh, um, um, uh, for, 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 from um, in, in a form where gender is 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 really uh, being helped, and and also I do not see children in that picture. It means number one, they are either in school or number two, um, which I hope they are not. They are working on the fields, so you can be able to to, to also address social sustainability uh, issues when you analyze um, just a, a setting like that one. Thank you very much. The objective is to have a borderless point between you know each countries so if you are looking at uh, the trade or, or let's say the informal trade between Kenya and Uganda between Kenya and Tanzania and all this with the proper working of the system we should not be having issue of the informal trade like the lady said I mean if people are informed about you know which goods should pass through then we should not be seeing any you know any informal trade between these two countries I don't know whether the research had a way of capturing what was there before we had custom union and whether what we have now, whether we have seen a reduction in terms of, you know, informal trade because now the, you know, we are talking of borderless. It's like trading within one country. So then we should not be talking of informal trade between the countries. And the other thing also we've seen that uh, the informal sectors, they actually grow and become big. So at what stage do we say now, okay, they have now closed, they are no longer informal, now they are formal. But the more important point, I think our objective is to make sure that there's no border between, so we, we should not really be talking about any informal trade between the East African community. If, let's say, the goods they are trading in is agriculture, 
which actually meet the rules of origin anyway. They are properly manufactured in those countries. So if we remove all non-tariff barriers, we should not be having issue of you know, informal trade between these countries. When uh, the DPC of Trademark East Africa opened this session, uh, he said that he was hoping for practical recommendations arising from this study. And I actually thought that your presentation And, and I thought your presentation resonated uh, with his request, and especially um, when I related with experiences around cross-border trade in Rwanda. Uh, it has grown over time, albeit with some challenges. And um, through the studies and through uh, support from Trademark East Africa, we actually want to um, implement some of the recommendations you've, you've, you've highlighted, you know, including targeted support for women in cross-border trade. And that is starting to happen, you know, training in um, simplified trade regime, training around ESC, training around standards, um, access to finance through grants that are, are, are disseminated through uh, savings and cooperative uh, associations uh, for women to access fi financing for, for, these, uh, um, for this type of trade. And uh, we want to scale that up. We want to scale that up through uh, more targeted support at, at different border areas to, to, to support our women, in, women former cross-border traders, youth, uh, as, well as, as, as well as men. So I wanted to say your, your study made a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, I just want to you know, touch on the issue of simplified rules of origin as one major solution, um, which also suggests that to fix a lot of these issues, we need to strengthen advocacy systems. Okay, so um, a lot of non-tariff barriers are actually occasioned by agents at the border points who are supposed to support trade, to positively regulate trade. And we've been getting complaints from traders on both sides of the border in, in Rwanda and, and Uganda who say uh, they have confusion around rules of origin, uh, around which product comes from where, and then the border customs officials actually exploit these information asymmetries and basically extort you know, some kind of implicit tax. So strengthening advocacy systems is extremely crucial. Addressing the issue of information is very crucial. And I think I've been having discussions with the country uh, director in Rwanda about this issue. And I had some really good uh, ideas coming out from him, including the creation of a simplified rules of origin system that's mobile phone based. So we're here working very hard to address time constraints at the border points, but uh, travelers, the traders who put ply the routes you know, on, the, on the buses actually delay other East Africans who want to cross the borders on time. And, and really declaring small quantities of goods from where you get them so they can go through the border points in a seamless fashion is extremely crucial. I think that Trademark is actually the go-to agency for these kinds of solutions. Thank you. On the, it's just like a reflection on the formalization of informal cross-border trade. Uh, we, have, we have a support from Trademark East Africa, and you have been working with women who are informal cross-border trade around, they are about, they are more than 400, and so far, they are organized into cooperatives, so it is, uh, they are way formalized. But in the course of the, in the process of implementation of the project, uh, we had some, some, some comments around uh, different partners that, why should we formalize the informal, the women who are informal cross-border trade? So I think here yeah, it's, it's, it's a good time that we discuss on this and for us we find that it's very important that they are formalized because if they are not formalized, then it's very difficult for them to access uh, finance institutions and support these women who are in informal cross-border trade. So I just want to highlight that it's very important that we formalize informal cross-border trade so that they can be supported through different areas, education, and, and other four, thank you. The first one, which is a minor one. I just want to, make, uh, to do justice to the great work that, I am a staff of the tra trademark, by the way. So the, to do justice to the great work that we are doing at the borders, and to make sure that at least those ones are reflected in your analysis, and to know exactly if those interventions are making things better or worse, or where are we? in regard to the recommendations that you are making. That's a minor one, but the, the more controversial one, and this is exactly what the value I wanted to pass through, is that focus on formalization for informal sector doesn't work. Formalization 
is not a means, it's an end. But previous analysis have shown that if you want to make a bit progress around those issues, you better focus on legitimization. So let's do our policy dialogue in a smart way to make sure that authorities and regulatory authorities actually legitimize some of this work that our women are, are making. Aligning to regional rates actually changes your baseline scenario, right? So are you actually increasing tariffs by aligning on the CET rates? Are you decreasing them? On what goods do you actually produce those goods? Or are you rather a uh, net importing countries, etc.? cetera? Um, so again, very case-specific, case very context-specific. Uh, we reviewed two studies that looked at countries in Rwanda and Nigeria. A 2012 study on Rwanda that sort of found um, that by introducing uh, the ACCET, uh, particularly the rates uh, of the sensitive list item, uh, which are heavily protected in the AC, that would lead to about a 4% increase in the consumption basket of a typical poor household, right? Um, so there again, we can see very disaggregated effect depending on uh, what consumers we're actually talking about. Nigeria, uh, I should stress here that the ECOWAS CET isn't implemented yet. It's gonna be implemented in 2015, so in a few months. But our next ANTE study in Nigeria, um, again, classic case of you know, different distributional impacts. Um, just because Nigeria is quite protectionist, it's Africa's number one economy, it is quite protective of its own market because it has significant productive capacities. By aligning on the rates of ECOWAS, um, Nigeria would actually bring its protection down which would have a positive impact on consumer prices for agricultural products, right? You'd have a decrease in protection in, in about 70%, um, you know, percentage points. But again, um, producers in the rural region of Nigeria that produce the goods that come into direct competition with